happy Pride Month. Every month is Pride Month, but happy end of June 2022. Today I wanted to sit down and do my reading wrap up of the books that I read in honor of Pride Month. Again, every single second is Pride Second. Every single month is Pride Month, but I'm a sucker for any excuse to theme my reading, so that's what I did. And before I get into my wrap up, I wanted to roll the footage of me shopping for some of these books at Barnes & Noble. So let's get in our time machine and go back to the past when we did that, and I hope you enjoy. Call Me By Your Name by Andre Ackerman, Osman. And I actually am just sitting here right now coming from watching the movie. I'm feeling a little bit emosh. I definitely will say I preferred the book to the movie, but when does that not happen? I preferred the book, but the movie was still really moving. It was really good. And Timothy Chalamet is like, I think he's just one of our generations or my generation's best actors. I read this in a day basically sitting by the pool in this sweltering heat and it was very atmospheric and it was probably the perfect setting to read this book. This book we follow Elio and Oliver. Now Elio lives in Italy with his parents and he's 17 and his father is a professor and every summer for six weeks they have like a guest come stay with them like help 
the dad with filing, doing paperwork and stuff like that. Usually the guest is like an academic and they're working on like writing something or something like that. And Oliver's coming, he's a philosopher. Oliver and Elio meet. Well, we hear from Elio's perspective and it's basically him experiencing this extreme desire. Elio and Oliver then go on to have a relationship. This is also a lot about art and the sensuality of art. It's about closeness with another human being, with another body, with another human being through art. Found interesting in this too. Themes of closeness through witnessing and experiencing and, and by witnessing therefore accepting the other person's shame. I mean more so physical bodily shame. Elio in here and in the movie has like a nosebleed and there's vomiting and having to go to the restroom. <laughs> Things like that. Just basic bodily functions functions that would otherwise, otherwise incite shame. Being able to witness that in someone else and have that witnessed in you by that same person is like an overwhelming experience of closeness, you know, coupled with sexual themes in here and the sexual scenes and the sexual closeness in that regard is like peak closeness and really being able to experience almost somebody's body as your own, you know, like the whole call me by your name thing in here. In the symposium, they're talking about love and why we experience love and where that desire for closeness comes from. One of the discussions in the symposium is feeling like, or maybe at one point, human beings were two human beings and we were connected and that we were then separated at one point. Um, and different gendered groups too. So like there was men and women who were combined into one being and men and men and women and women and sometimes three people. How at one point they were then separated. The whole experience of being alive now is then wanting to get back to that place where you're connected with your other half so like the idea of a soulmate and things like that and I felt like you know with that being mentioned kind of or referred to and alluded to in this book and it being call me by your name and Elio and Oliver calling each other by their names and witnessing each other's bodily shame kind of drive that point home just that closeness that you can experience with another human being and I think to the parallel of of all the discussions of art in this book whether it be through music or sculptures or what have you. Art is another way to call to human beings to say here this is who I am, this is what I feel. Are you experiencing this the same way? Do you feel this too? Can we then connect? This book is all about it's just all about that. It's all about desiring connection and desiring being more than just your body. So I really liked this book. I thought that it was it was a really beautiful read. And again, the setting in which I read it was very atmospheric. Needless to say, Call Me By Your Name was a five star. The next book that I have here, Patricia Highsmith's The Price of Salt. This would be the perfect book I feel like to read in a classroom setting or in a book club setting because it's just rife with symbolism. I feel like if you take this book at the surface level and the plot of this book, I could gripe with certain things that happened in here and how quickly things happened, which I'll talk about what this book is about in a second, but let me get through my thoughts. If you look at the book at the surface of it, um, I could have some gripes with it. But if you break it down, look at what Patricia Highsmith was trying to say and what she successfully did say, I believe, it was very well done. I gave this four stars, so let me tell you what this is about. This is set in the 50s, written in the 50s, published in the 50s. It follows a young girl who, I think she's like 19. She's a stage designer. She's waiting to, you know, like break into that industry and finally get jobs on her resume. But in the meantime, she's working at a department store. She's working in like the children's toy section or a doll section or what have you and one day we have a character come in whose name is Carol. She, our main character, immediately feels desire for this woman. She becomes, I'm gonna use the word obsessed with her because that's kind of how I felt, but she becomes very attached. They go on then to have a relationship from there. At one point, I don't know if this is spoilers, so spoilers I guess from here on out. Later in the book go on to basically have like a road trip cross country. There's like a detective because Carol's husband or she's going through a divorce and she has a child with her husband or her ex-husband. Her husband is like hires a private investigator to follow Carol and Therese cross country to like get damning evidence basically to keep Carol from having custody of their daughter. That's like later in the book. I feel like Patricia Highsmith was more so really trying to say something about male control of the feminine and 
feminine desire, obviously. Also like feeling trapped in your life, feeling trapped within the parameters of societal expectation, especially around this time, obviously in these two women desire each other and love each other and um, but feeling trapped by the constraints of society basically and there's a scene in here where Therese is flying a kite with her friend slash lover who's a man who's been in her life for a long time and she's flying a kite and this man comes over and like cuts the tail of the kite but while she was flying it she was so happy and this man comes and cuts her freedom away essentially. So I felt like that was very poignant, you know? I should also mention that Therese is a lot younger than Carol too, so it's the age dynamic kind of going on there and also the class dynamic because Carol's very wealthy and Therese has like no money of her own so that's a very interesting theme there. Therese also has like, a fraught or doesn't really have a relationship with her mother so at times I really wasn't sure if Patricia Highsmith was trying to make a comment about Reese's psychological state by her relationship with Carol, who is also a wealthier woman, or who is a wealthier woman, who's who's also an older woman, obviously, you know. Her mom's obviously older than her, but anyway. Specifically, there's a tie because in the beginning, Therese mentions to Carol about the shame that she feels for accepting a $200 check from her mother when she was away at boarding school and she had graduated. Then later on in the novel, Carol gives Therese a $200 check. Therese doesn't accept it, so I felt like there was a connection there as well. I really do feel like it was mostly about these women trying to find freedom and the liberation in their lives, not only to be together, but also the liberation from like a patriarchal society. The main gripe that I have with this book, if I'm talking about like the surface level plot of this book, is that I feel like it was just it was complete insta-love, okay? If we are ascribing modern day romance tropes to this classic literary novel, it was very insta-lovey, okay? And I had a hard time getting behind that and fully buying into it. Therese Mann was obsessed with this woman from the off. She was in love with this woman from like page 10. So I had a hard time with that, but I could obviously get past it because Patricia Highsmith is a beautiful writer. She's a fantastic writer and I really feel like she was saying something here. Oh. The whole, I wanted to mention, because it really struck me while I was reading this, the whole concept of salt in this book. Because a lot of the times when I'm reading a book, I try to tie in the title with the, the themes of what's going on. And I had a harder time with the whole salt thing. Like the price of salt. Okay, what exactly does that mean in relation to this book? Well, there's a scene where salt is mentioned and salt basically being your undeniable truth, like the truth that sits inside you that's that's like the gritty salt, you know? Which I feel like could also tie into the whole witnessing and experiencing others' shame and your own shame and embracing that in Call Me By Your Name. It's like finding the salt in others and finding the salt in yourself and moving with that, feeling free with that. But it's gritty, it's salt, it's not always easy. You know what I mean? The next book that I have here is A Modern Romance. Okay, so different than the last two that I just mentioned. And that is A Lady for a Duke by Alexis Hall. This book was good fun. Okay, I don't usually rate like contemporary romance novels very high, so I gave this a three star. This book follows Viola Carroll, who a few years prior was in the Battle of, at Waterloo. This is a historical novel. It's very Bridgerton-esque. She was in the Battle of Waterloo and she was presumed dead at the time and she went with it. Like she went with it. She's like, yeah, bitches, I am dead. She felt trapped in the life that she had at the time before she was presumed dead. So then she goes on to uh, live in her truth and live her, her life after that, but everyone in her prior life kind of presumes her dead, except for her sister-in-law and her brother, who she lives with. She is a trans woman, so there's beautiful representation in this book. Basically meets her old best friend, and he is struggling because he was also at the Battle of Waterloo, and he has PTSD, and he feels so bereft and sad that his friend had passed away, and he blames himself. Viola and her sister-in-law go to visit him and his sister to see what's going on, and basically they fall in love. This was just cute, good fun and cute. So if that sounds good to you, I'd recommend it. Okay. This is the last book that I read for like my pride themed reading and it's for sure gonna be one of my favorite books of the year Okay, and this is I cannot believe it took me so long to finally get to this author, but Giovanni's Room by James Baldwin 
So this is set in 1950s Paris. So obviously we have Giovanni, it's Giovanni's room. And then we have our main character, I think his name is David. They are living in Paris and David is there with his older friend and they go to a bar one night. David meets Giovanni basically and they go on to have a relationship from there. This book has probably one of my favorite first lines in a book, let me read it to you. I stand at the window of this great house in the south of France as night falls. The night which is leading me to the most terrible morning of my life. And then it's just forever beautiful from there on. We learn on the first page that Giovanni is going to be put to death. We then go back and, and see David meeting Giovanni and the relationship that they had from there. I don't know if I have another book that comes to mind or a book that I've read ever that better exemplifies the importance of pride, genuinely. Because these people are not doing well. They end up in terrible situations because of that repression and the internalized homophobia that our main character has. I just, I, I just don't know if I can think of another book that, that better demonstrates and exemplifies the importance of pride. And I think Let's have, a, let's have a chat here. You know, we're in Pride Month. I think pride is the most, or one of the most important things we as humans and as societies need for literally everything, literally everything. I think that the more obvious ways in which pride is celebrated, obviously incredibly important, but two, it trickles down to every little thing that people then feel, I think, insecure about in our mean to each other about and horrible to each other about and we live in a world that just needs liberation like we are constantly constrained by our own ideas of what is right and what is wrong and what does that fucking even mean like what does that even mean just be good be good people be yourself access your own inner magic and be brave enough to let that out but also be the type of person that creates an environment in the world or at least in your corner of the world that allows other people to feel brave enough to let that magic out themselves do you know what i mean i just feel like pride applies to literally everything so i, I anyways i feel like this book was just it was just, it was just so good. Obviously, it's within the context of in a sexual relationship and a romantic relationship in, in, in this specific book. This is like true good shit literature. The themes, the themes in here too, and also in Call Me By Your Name, of when people come into your lives and completely change you, you would define yourself by your experience with that person or by that person in a way. And it's never permanent. It's never permanent. The way people come in and out of your lives and some people just completely, completely change you. But we all, no matter what the significance of that person or that moment in our, our lives was, it will never last forever. We will always just come back to ourselves as individuals and it's painful it's painful and i feel like both these books really beautiful beautifully demonstrate that it's like i'm vibing man i'm vibing thinking about this book there's a quote on page five that i wrote so many times after highlighting so many things this connects to this quote on page five this connects back to this quote on page five the quote on page five is it was this last fact which was our undoing for nothing is more unbearable, once one has it, than freedom. I suppose this was why I asked her to marry me, to give myself something to be moored to. Perhaps this was why, in Spain, she decided that she wanted to marry me. But people can't, unhappily, invent their mooring posts, their lovers and their friends, any more than they can invent their parents. Life gives these and also takes them away, and the great difficulty is to say yes to life. I feel like if I were to pick out one quote from this book, that's what I would pick out. Not because it's the best, but most significant, I think, to the points in this whole novel. This book too is a lot about loneliness and Giovanni's loneliness specifically and Dave, everyone's loneliness, but the symbolism that comes with walls and rooms and Giovanni's room is really beautiful and, and 
like the quote I just read really ties back I think to the quote about mooring posts and inventing your own mooring post and needing something to be moored to and wanting to bring someone into your room and keep them there and change their room for them to stay there. There's a lot in here about Giovanni um, wanting to redo his room and taking the bricks out and making it nice so David wants to stay. It's just devastating and beautiful. <laughs> this book is devastating so that's all I'm gonna say about Giovanni's room but I feel like I could go on forever and just please read this book. Alrighty so last but not least a book that I started but I didn't get too far into and I didn't finish. Angels in America by Tony Kushner. The subtitle is A Gay Fantasia on National Themes. This was recommended to me actually by someone I knew in real life years ago and so I always intended to pick it up and I finally did. I can't wait to continue with this. I read the first few pages and immediately wrote down there. Wow, this book is going to be amazing. Eloquent thoughts, yes, thank you. Um, this is a play, actually. I really don't know what this is about quite yet. It starts at a funeral, and like a rabbi is performing a funeral. That's how it starts. It's been talking so far, like just in that short point, talking about national identity and death. Apparently it's one of the most honored American plays in history. It won the Tony Awards and the Pulitzer Prize for drama, but excited to continue with this and I just thought I'd put that out there in case it sounded, but in case it sparks you fancy. So that is my 2022 Pride Month reading wrap up. Again, like I said in the beginning, I'm genuinely a sucker for any excuse to theme my reading, like any excuse. Every single day is Pride day every single month is pride month every single hour second minute is pride minute month second just remember that for everyone and yourself it will honestly create a better world in every single regard so um read good books think about things and let me know what you read for pride month let me know the good shit that you read for pride month okay let me know the good shit so yeah i hope you have a great rest of your day and enjoy your summer Okay, enjoy your summer. Yeah, enjoy your day. Thanks for watching. Bye.